Well, if we go out on the internet and, and try to find a definition of, of biorefinery, you will find quite a few ones. So let's make it simple here, just to say that we have a number of conversion technologies and separation technologies that has the purpose to uh, convert biomass to a variety of different uh, products. And uh, you can see that these products have different uh, properties and it will not be possible to just have one type of biorefinery here. We will have many types of biorefinery. Therefore, we are also... Uh, Okay, it seems that, uh, that uh, this is not the final version of, of my presentation. <laughs> uh, so I was just about to, to say that also Henrik Thurman and Lisbeth Olsson will present that. So we will be three persons. So let's see what kind of slides that will appear here in, in, in the future. Well, one of the reasons why we need uh, biorefinery is, of course, that, that we have the carbon dioxide problem uh, as we have now and if we change to bioresources we can replace some of the uh, fossil material another reason is of course also that the fossil resources are limited uh, we will have them for a while we have used them for for almost 100 years and there may will be some time that we can use them in the future also there are some differences between uh, uh, biomaterial and, and uh, fossil ma raw material. There are quite a few differences. Uh, one or a couple of interesting facts is, for example, that the CO2 that is released by fossil fuels is about two times larger than the uptake of carbon dioxide on the plants growing on land. And that is, of course, the reason why we have an increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Another fact that is quite interesting is that the heat value of the fossil fuel is about one and a half to two times higher than the heat value of biomass. So what does this mean? Well, the amount of available biomaterial, if we should use it in a sustainable way, will be very scarce. So we have to think in a little bit different way in the future when we use our raw material. We will, for example, use a lot of different waste material and I represent it here as, as uh, let's see, what this lamp doesn't work either. So we, ha we, we have a wood residue from uh, harvesting from process streams. We may have agriculture residue. We may use algae, household waste and so on in order to produce a number of different products. And we can see here that the properties of, of the raw materials here are quite different. And the, the properties of the produced um, material here is also quite uh, different. And that means that we cannot, cannot use only one type of biorefinery. We will have many types of biorefineries in, in the future. All these biorefineries need to be very energy efficient, of course. And we also need to choose the raw material to the different biorefinery types very carefully in order to have as high yield as possible in the future. That also be a need to integrate these biorefinery in, in the material flow in the society, in the total material flow. And what do I mean with that? Well. We have to use the concept of reuse and recycling much more in the future compared to what we do today. We have to use the raw material in several different steps. We can, for example, if we use wood as, 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 as a raw material, we know that today we, we can use that for making packaging material. We can use the fibers for making packaging material. We can use them for six to eight times approximately. Thereafter, the quality of the fibers will be too bad and we can uh, see what we can use the fibers for after that. We can, for example, use the nanostructures here in order to enhance the packaging material or to make composite material. And uh, we should design these in, in such a way that we can, of course, reuse them a couple of times. 
but the quality will be a little bit lower. Of course, when, when we try to recycle them, and um, these nanostructures are made up of, of uh, polymers, cellulose polymers, and we can actually use them in order to make textiles in the future. Today, when we are doing textiles from cellulose, we're using the wood material directly, but in the future we have to use that cellulose in a couple of other purposes before we use them as textiles. In all these processes, we will have a number of byproducts, and for these byproducts, we can, of course, make different chemicals and energy carriers. And that is a way to use the carbons many times before we combust it. What to expect in the future? Well, as I said, we will have a lot number of different raw materials. We will need a couple of different uh, types of, of uh, biorefineries. And uh, at Chalmers, we are working quite broadly uh, for, with different types of biorefineries. And I will talk a couple of minutes of, of uh, chemical and mechanical-based processes. Lisbeth will then talk about uh, uh, roads based on biotechnology, and Henry will talk about roads based on gasification and li liquefying. But I will start with the processes based on chemical and mechanical processes. And these can be quite efficient because here we are looking for the different constituents, nanostructures, polymers, and different monomers. And if we do the uh, design of the process in a correct way, they can be very energy efficient. And they are also resource efficient because here we are also using the oxygen in wood. Wood consists of about 45% oxygen. So here we can use that molecule also. So that is quite important. There is, of course, a challenge here. And the challenge here is that biomaterial is a very complicated biocomposite. It has evolved for millions of years, and it is very tough. So it's quite difficult to disintegrate uh, these biomaterials. Uh, if we take a look at the structure and composition of wood, uh, we have used timber for thousands of years. We know how to do that. If we go down one step to the fiber, we have used the fibers here for, what is it, 140 years approximately for different paper products. What we're doing now is to go one step below here into the cell wall of the fibers. And the cell wall of the fibers consists of cellulose, which is a, a, a glucose polymer. It's quite a large one, it's linear, and they um, end up as microfibrils. It's a number of polymers that are, are um, uh, crystallized in, in uh, microfibrils here. And these microfibrils are embedded in a matrix consisting of lignin, which is an aromatic structure, macromolecule, and also some hemicelluloses, which also are uh, carbohydrates, but much smaller compared to the cellulose. Now we're down in nanostructures here. And the overall challenge here is to separate the different components. And this is a separation in nanoscale, in a matter of fact. And if we take a look at the cell wall structure, we have the cellulose um, fibrils that are embedded in this matrix of, of lignin and, and hemicellulosis. And what we should do here is to decouple these so we have them as a mixture. But the job is not done here. We also have to separate and purify these components. So very important steps here are, are the downstream separation afterwards. For this type of biorefineries, I can see in the near future at least two types. And one of them, is based on what we can call pulp wood. And that is uh, the, the quality of wood that we are producing fibers from today. And uh, this process is actually has the platform in the present craft process. And about 80% of all fibers for different paper products are produced with the craft process uh, today. And we add some new suitable processes. The products will we'll be, of course, 
uh, fibers for, for different packaging, hygiene uh, purposes and so on, but also lignin, hemicellulosis and extractive based uh, products. New things that are interesting is um, nanostructures of cellulose. It's crystalline and fibrillated, and of course also dissolving pulp or textile pulp that are uh, uh, that, that we use different textiles from. The other is based on forage residue. And here we don't care about the pulp fibers. We're just looking at the different constituents from nanostructures to polymers to monomers. Now we'll talk a little bit about these two. Uh, the one based on pulp wood, well, as I said, the conventional uh, craft process. Uh, we have to add some kind of lignin extraction, and here we have, together with uh, Inventia and Valment, developed the process, lignin post process, that is an existing process today. Uh, what we also have to do is to take care of hemicellulosis, and they are quite sensitive, so we have to remove them prior to the craft process. And here we are working with uh, some mild steam explosion here, and we combine it with enzymatic treatment and leaching, and we can remove hemicellulosis, but that is under development. So this is a process that can be, uh, well, part of it is already here with the lignobost in, in the crop process, but we also have to add this part. The other, based on forest residue, well, you can have some different approaches. Our approach is, is um, that we first take care of, of the hemicellulosis. They are quite sensitive, so we use the same technique as, in the, uh, as with when we are working with the crop process, mild steam explosion and somatic treatment. To separate the cellulose and lignin, we have chosen a uh, uh, alkaline method in order to preserve lignin and also the, the cellulose. The nice thing with this is that we are only looking at the molecular or nanostructure, and we don't care about the quality of the fibers. This means that we can use much more efficient process technology, uh, fewer steps and, and more efficient steps, in a matter of fact. So the, the uh, process will be cheaper compared to a craft process. Uh, low temperature, of course, and also cheap. Uh, chemicals. So, uh, in overall, it looks like this. we remove the hemicellulosis, it's weak acid, it's autohydrolysis uh, combined with, with uh, steam explosion. We have an alkaline step, separate the lignin and cellulose, and we have a lignin platform and carbohydrate platform where we can produce different kind of products. One possible process looks like this, and I will not go through this. I would say a few words about the steam explosion in, in the beginning, very few words about the, the alkaline treatment where we separate the cellulose and the lignin. We are uh, at the moment working with that. I would say some few more, few more words about the ling where we, how we take care of the lignin in this process. And the interesting thing here is that we have, re if we compare with the crop process, we have replaced two quite expensive process units, evaporation and the recovery boiler with the lignin conversion unit. The first, the steam explosion. That is quite mild. We are working in the temperature between 110 and 170 degrees C. When we have the highest temperature, well, the wood chips become a little bit darker at 140. Well, they look like normal wood chips almost. We will have a high yield at high temperature, but on the other hand, the molecular weight will decrease with, with the increasing temperature. So depending on what kind of hemicellulosis we want as a product, we have to choose the temperature. Uh, this is also one step where we activate the, the wood, and it will be much more easy for the enzymes to work on the wood after this treatment. So it has a dual function here. We are working with with uh, in kilogram scale with this kind of equipment here at Chalmers. The separation between cellulose and, and lignin, well, this is, of course, a key operation here. I will not say anything about this. We are developing a, a new method. 
And we have some results that are very promising, but they are a little bit too early to be presented here. I will come back in a few months about that. A few words about the depolymerization of, of lignin. We are working with a, a catalyzed process. It's a base catalyzed. We also have a solid uh, catalyst here. We're using a capping agent in order to, to um, take care of, of uh, radicals here. Presently, we are working with uh, phenols. It's not realistic from an industrial point of view, so the next step will be to replace that with a more realistic capping agent. Uh, high pressures, moderate temperatures, and we are working in kilogram scale here also in, in, in a continuous equipment. We have worked for five, six years now, and we have got quite a lot of, of results, so we start to understand how this process works. One example can be seen here, we have used the lignin boost lignin. We, of course, get some char, 15 to 20 percent. The main product is a bio oil, 55 to 60 percent. And we also got some uh, water soluble organics. It's phenolic compounds here that can be extracted and hopefully be used in the chemical industry. The bio oil, the main part is a light oil, and it's mostly monomers and dimers in, in that. Then we have a heavier structure. In the beginning, we thought that this was unreacted lignin, but we have later found that there has no similarities with lignin here. They are repolymerized monomers, actually, and they are quite interesting for perhaps doing other things than, than, than just the fuel here. We are investigating that right now. One interesting thing here is that the bio oil that we produce has very good storage properties compared to other bio oils. In room temperature, we can store it for years and nothing happens. And 80 degree, we have, well, we can store it uh, at least for a month and very little happens here. One reason for that is that we have decreased the oxygen content quite a lot in the bio oil from a little bit above 40% to below 20% here. I've not talked much about downstream separation, but they are as important as the reactor, actually. And we are working with some of the key operations here. Uh, filtration of how to filter and compressible material, for, for example, different cellulose materials, evaporation. And we have started to work with membrane separation and, and we are focusing on investigating fouling mechanism. And in all cases here, we actually have very unique worldwide equipment. So some of these investigations can only be done in, uh, at Chalmers, in a matter of fact. Okay. With that, I will hand over to Lisbeth. And I think it was about 18 minutes, yes. <laughs>